This is an area, I want to talk a little bit about uh, synthetic cannabinoids. This is an area that I find absolutely fascinating, so I might go off on a few tangents here and there, but it's also an area that's filled with um, myths and it's very difficult for the science to keep up with what's happening uh, in the field. So I'm going to try and sift through some of the more hysterical things around synthetic cannabinoids. Now, this, what synthetic cannabinoids are, you might have heard them referred to as noids or chronic or spice or black mamba or synthetic cannabinoids or herbal incense or herbal tea. There are a range of products that are designed uh, to kind of, with the intent of mimicking the effects of cannabis. Now, to call them synthetic cannabinoids is, is a tad misleading because uh, natural cannabis is a plant-derived substance with hundreds of different active components and we don't actually know what all of the components are doing. One particularly important one is cannabidiol, which has protective effects against some of the adverse um, uh, influences of THC. Um, they're probably best thought of as synthetic uh, cannabinoid receptor agonists um, in that they are designed from a literature aiming to uh, hit receptor sites, both the uh, CB1 and CB2 receptor sites, particular CB1, which is located most densely in the CNS. Um, however, they are quite different to the way that THC um, affects these receptor sites. So THC binds strongly to these areas, uh, but it, it's a partial agonist. Um, the synthetic cannabinoids are typically full agonists, so they have a greater effect at lower doses. Um, and they also have very different uh, kinetics in terms of uh, some of them have very quick uh, modes of uh, onset, uh, very different half-life. Some you'll get a, a stoned and it'll be over within 10 minutes. Um, other not particularly successful ones have had uh, periods of time where you've been intoxicated for um, uh, over a day, which uh, is not something that people are necessarily seeking. The other reason that uh, synthetic cannabinoid receptor agonist uh, becomes a little bit of a misleading title is that that assumes that that's all that they do. And we're increasingly um, being aware that some of the newer variants in this family actually have a lot of off-target effects. So some of the newer drugs actually have got um, uh, structures added on to the general backbone which fit quite nicely in serotonergic receptors uh, so that they also bring a risk of serotonergic syndrome. There's also um, some evidence that some of them will have uh, impacts on uh, monoamine oxidase. So, where do they come from? And, and this is uh, one of my favourite things about these. It's basically they've come from uh, the, the general public uh, hijacking basic science uh, for recreational purposes. So uh, there's been a series of uh, very lovely uh, gents that have worked on and, and their lab groups, are, who I'm sure are not just gents, um, who have worked on understanding the mechanisms of THC, trying to, to synthesise it, trying to uh, use it for medications. And they've done a lot of work which they've published in the academic literature or um, have uh, put out in patent literature with some nice information about how strongly they bind to cannabinoid receptors. So um, people in the marketplace have taken that information and gone, oh, that's a great target drug. Uh, cannabis is illegal. These things certainly don't seem to be explicitly illegal, illegal, so here's a thing that we can bring to market. Now, uh, I'll talk a bit about regulatory processes around these drugs, but um, basically all of the things where there is any actual basic underlying science have been used in the market so, um, and have exited the market because they've all largely been systematically banned or there's uh, urine tests for them. So the things that are currently on the market are quite literally, literally designed by just random people on the internet. There's some great websites. If you look at isomer design, there are people that have created a whole bunch of potential analogues of cannabidiol, that, uh, uh, 
uh, cannabinoids that you may be interested in checking out. And so people are going to the market very quickly without having any sense of what's really going on. So the pace of these things is quite rapid, uh, depending on who's doing the counting. Uh, they kind of first um, have popped up on the market in 2004, first were chemically verified in 2008, so it's not a new phenomenon, but uh, the number of structures available has uh, increased exponentially over time. Uh, we're currently in the realm of there's around 180 which have come to the illicit market and been identified. There's a few more that are there in sort of a bit more of a, well, what the uh, United uh, Nations Office on Drug and Crime have examined. Uh, and we're in the situation where since January we've already got three entirely novel substances that have been identified in the, in the world. So what we have is we've got a very rapid um, pace of development. The rapid pace um, is kind of uh, produced by a, a number of different factors. Number one is uh, the people that are producing these want to keep these legal or at least not explicitly illegal. Uh, and so when something comes to, to market, as soon as uh, science catch up with it in terms of adverse events or it's uh, uh, tested, then uh, governments may try and ban these substances and then the marketplace shifts on very quickly from there. Another big driver is the ability to pick up certain things by urine drug screens because that's a big driver uh, uh, for why people are interested in these substances. Uh, there's quite that of an entrepreneurial spirit in that people bring things to market very quickly and are happy for it to fail and move on to another substance. Uh, but also, there's also the thing that you see is that there's been a push towards steadily more potent variations of the forms, just like you see with genetic uh, growing of natural cannabis. So uh, if you look at the structures down the side over here, we see um, J, uh, THC is only a partial agonist of the C uh, cannabinoid receptors. Uh, the JWH uh, compounds, which were first to market, were kind of similar in a little bit stronger. Uh, but now we're dealing with substances as time has progressed that are, are one to two orders of magnitude more potent than uh, natural cannabis and also full agonists. So what do we know about the prevalence of past year use in Australia? We hear a lot about uh, synthetic uh, cannabinoids, particularly in New Zealand. They had uh, quite the market and uh, were sort of international leaders in the area uh, and also in Europe. But in Australia, it hasn't necessarily caught on quite to the extent that it has elsewhere. If you look at our National Drug Strategy household surveys, we saw that in uh, 2013, about 1% of the population uh, reported using synthetic cannabinoids in the past year. Um, between uh, the two surveys, there was a significant decline in the people that had used that. Uh, and when you look at who was using it, it was more common among uh, very young people, which is probably the worst time to be trying these things, and also uh, what's often referred to as suited and booted people, people that may not have access to uh, typical cannabis or might be under, you know, uh, under urine screen uh, regimens. Okay, so part of the reason for that uh, drop-off is that uh, between those two surveys uh, there was a big change in the law um, whereby uh, previous to that uh, in Australia our regulations had kind of been uh, playing catch-up and uh, when new things came to market they'd be um, made illegal. Uh, and so a new thing would come to the market. So similar to the UK in 2015, we've got a, a very broad psychoactive substances bill whereby anything that has a psychoactive effect is effectively illegal uh, to import. And that is, uh, it's expedient in terms of these harms, but uh, it does hold up a lot of progress in science and trying novel things. Of course, that hasn't necessarily um, changed what you can buy. So this is what I did on Valentine's Day. I hunted around for Australian sites where I could buy synthetic cannabinoids 
And uh, my partner does like herbal tea, but I didn't think I'd be able to get away with um, getting her uh, three grams of uh, Mind Rape Extreme. I didn't think that would necessarily go down very well. But sites are there. They're very easy to find. It was on the first page of my Google search. Um, the only information on the site I, I particularly like here, over a thousand Australian miners swear by us. We keep your mines high and your jobs safe. Um, we guarantee, we certify that um, everything's legal and uh, guaranteed undetectable in all urine tests. So these things, there was a drop off in the market but it's starting to creep back up locally. Um, how, I'll skip that, how do these things um, appear in terms of their presentations? So. They come in array, an array of forms. So uh, typically um, they're um, sold as herbal incense or herbal tea or herbal products. And there might be a list of ingredients on a packet. And what it actually is, is it's uh, just a general combustible herbal matter which has had synthetic cannabinoids either mixed in or sprayed onto it to allow it to be uh, smoked. Um, and uh, that is probably the lion's share of the market. But we're moving into newer areas which are, um, make things ever more complex. We're starting to see uh, in the US there's a big market in uh, legal uh, vape fluids that have cannabidiol in them. Uh, and some of those products have actually been shown to, yes, they have cannabidiol, uh, but some of the more popular ones, including the one um, uh, that uh, branded by uh, Tommy Chong from Chi Chin Chong uh, has quite a significant amount of synthetic cannabinoid in it as well. We're, uh, and we're also seeing, uh, particularly big in the UK, is that uh, synthetic cannabinoids can be uh, impregnated on paper and uh, that's been a mode of access for synthetic cannabinoids into the prison system. Uh, so that this is uh, a sales pitch from somebody on the dark web that is selling just A4 pages uh, that are you know, undetectable and easy to write on. This has led to the further indignity of uh, people in the prison system uh, having their mail opened, photocopied, and people get the photocopies rather than the originals. So it's caused, and in the prison system it has caused, in the UK in particular, it's caused quite a degree of disruption.